You are tuned in to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out, and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Greetings and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. Tonight, my guest is Mason Dwinell. Mason is the author of a groundbreaking spiritual odyssey which focuses on the use of sun gazing for cosmic energy and food, which is titled The Earth Was Flat. Uh, the idea that we can extract food and cosmic energy from the sun, decrease our food intake, and heal ourselves and the planet in the process is one of the subjects of Mason's book. Mason is a modern-day sun gazer and is also the subject of Peter Sorcher's award-winning and suspenseful documentary film that follows Mason on an unbelievable and often hilarious cross-country tour into the little-known world of sun gazing, an ancient practice of looking directly at the sun for a range of physical and spiritual benefits. The film is called Eat the Sun. Mason's website is www.sungazing.com, and you can find out more about the film Eating the Sun, Eat the Sun, at www.eatthesunmovie.com. So now, let's find out more about Mason and his amazing journey. Hi, Mason. How are you? Good. Good evening. Oh, good, good. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed your book and, uh, and have to admit that it's the inspiration for my own uh, starting the practice of sun gazing. Fantastic. <laughs> You're a brave, brave man to work through those pages. <laughs> Well, you're a brave man to go through those experiences and to, uh, you know, document your journey in kind of a daily journal uh, format, which is sometimes it's grueling to go through it with you. Uh, how did your journey with sun gazing begin? Um, <clears throat> so it began when I was at Chinese medicine school in San Francisco, California, um, in 2000. That's when I started school, and I think it was 2002. Um, there are four or five peers and myself who were definitely seeking the mystery, the unknown, the, the, the piece that we could feel it was there, but we hadn't quite touched. Um, and we were getting deep into meditation and sort of seeking out different experts in the never, never world. Um, and being at Chinese medicine school and being relatively close to Asia, there are constantly sort of guru-type people who came, Qigong masters and yoginis, and we heard stories of, you know, people walking on the beach without leaving footprints in the sand and folks mm. who were 400 years old. And um, that was all very compelling, but a lot of it, we weren't necessarily sold on the whole process, partially because <laughs> it's going to take a ton of work and years of sacrifice. Um, and a gentleman, HRM, an Indian fellow, um, came to town, and he put together a pretty simple lecture of a way that he found to help him become solar-powered, and he figured it was uh, one step toward world peace as far as if we can understand our hungers and just become more present and peaceful with ourselves, then, you know, that's the beginning of changing the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the practice of sun gazing. And he talked about just uh, sunrise or, or sunset, um, just as the sun is touching the horizon, looking at it for 10 seconds. Um, and then the next day for 20 seconds, and the next day for 30 seconds, 10 second increments. Um, and for some reason, the idea didn't terrify my little pack of friends. And <laughs> so, yeah, it really resonated with me. And we all started. and. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the first step's always a doozy. Um, but it's pretty amazing. You look look at the sun at, at sunrise, and you see you're you know, relatively high to the horizon, mm -hmm. especially if there's a little bit of pollution that helps. Um, the brightness sort of goes away in the first couple seconds, mm -hmm. and then you're just standing there looking at basically a, you know, a giant warm ball. Mm -hmm. um, it's super soft. 
So oh, yeah. it was it was mesmerizing, and the journey began. Wow. Well, I, I know the first uh, the first couple of times I did it <clears throat> was at uh, sun closer to sunset, and uh, <clears throat> the first time I, I had that experience that you talk about, and the uh, the the glare kind of just went away, and what I saw was kind of like a boiling, churning c- colors of blue and gold, and and it was really I mean I couldn't take my eyes off of it. And I thought, and I was counting mentally, you know, I didn't want to hurt my eyes, and I thought, 10 seconds, and it went to 20 and 30, and I, I wasn't feeling endangered at all, and it, it was low enough on the horizon that I'm sure I didn't do any danger, and, and my inner guidance said, no, you wouldn't be able to look at it if it was, uh, you know, causing you harm, so uh, it is quite an amazing experience. <clears throat> now, um, what are some of the things that HRM or that you found over a period of time are some of the side uh, effects and side benefits? Um, well, there are many. Um, the biggest is the, the sensation. Well, it's a couple things. I guess the sort of after sensation that lasts through the day mm-hmm. is, is for me, was just powerfully clean and and sort of pacifying in a way. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there was buying, uh, creating more patience, but it just sort of very little seemed to be able to ruffle my feathers, and my days were not effortless, but uh, a certain amount of ease. It was it was pretty astonishing. I was like, holy smokes, this actually <laughs> is affecting me. Um, and the other is just my the my awareness of everything, my senses, my awareness of how I felt, um, uh, how other people around me felt, uh, how different foods or drinks affected me, different smells, different touches. Um, and with, you know, I think the enlightenment, but also any sort of choices, it begins with awareness. You know, we're only aware of so if anything that is going to help that, that's sort of a, a soft practice, I think is, is beneficial. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> were you uh, were you a veg? I can't remember in the book if you were a vegetarian when you started this process. No, nope, definitely not. No, I I was uh, <laughs> uh, born and raised in New England, and I don't know at that time no one had ever heard of a vegetarian, especially in those parts. <laughs> right. So <laughs> they hung them out to dry. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been a California thing, right? Um, Crazy no, but uh, I was I was certainly aware of stuff that I was ingesting, but um, but as the practice continued and my vibration you know, increased, I certainly became more and more sensitive to different stuff, and to find a clean piece of meat that didn't completely rock my world was certainly a challenge, so yeah, meat sort of slipped away significantly uh-huh. to, almost, to almost nil. Um, what about some of the mystical experiences? Did, can you talk about the, the spiritual and mystical side of this? Um, yeah, that, uh, can get pretty intense. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to be careful with, um, as far as other dimensions and other creatures and Ah, going at it. Tell us about that. (laughs) Well, I'd actually, so I'd rather focus on not that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, because you'll bring them into being if you discuss them. Yeah, I mean, not only will you bring them into being, but I I want to try to instill, just because the alternative world can get pretty wonky pretty quick, which is great, and, and, and which is great and fun, and I love entertainment, so that's excellent. Right. But I do think that our whole journey here on Earth is to actually be here on Earth. Um, right, right. And right. yes, there certainly, there certainly are more dimensions and places and planets and creatures and all sorts of stuff that we can play with. Um, okay. But if we're doing that, we're not here. Right, um, right, right. So that is definitely a piece that I, I try to, to warn people to not get too carried away and just to understand at the end of the day, we want to just, you know, be here in our bodies now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that can be a tricky one because we're all so fired up for not being here. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. But that's sort of missing the point of Earth life. So, 
Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, there's a variety of reasons why we why we desire to not be here. Not only uh, a repulsion of of the what we see going on, which is a projection of our own darkness that hasn't been expressed; it's unconscious. But uh, our desire to be, uh, you know, uh, children of light and back in other uh, <laughs> other places where we came from and know we are from. So, you know, there is a big pull to be out of here, but. Uh, do you feel that this is a, a critical time on the planet now where we need to ground ourselves into the earth because of the shifts and changes that are, are in process? Uh, absolutely, you know, completely. Um, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, I mean, for folks who are aware, obviously, you can people can feel the, the shift in vibration and just the changes going along astrologically as well as everything to do with the earth and patterns and all of that. And, um, yeah, to be grounded, I mean, mostly just in ourselves, and um, that's the biggest place to start. But, yeah, for sure, more barefoot on the bare earth is going to help everything. Um, actually, when one of my first copies of The Earth Was Flat, I had originally written, like, 40 pages on why to be barefoot. Um, and then it <laughs> sounded a little bit too much, too preachy, so I cut it down to like two paragraphs and figured if people would go try it, they'd, they'd feel for it themselves. But yeah, yes, being in touch with nature is, is certainly important, especially now with not only all the crazy social networking and the speed of digital information, and, um, but that mixed with the way the earth is going with its vibration, we gotta, if we want to keep our sanity and health together. Slow it all down. Um, one of my other guests, uh, Santos Bonacci, mentored, mentioned this just a couple of weeks ago about the importance of walking barefoot on bare earth and the the uh, what it does, the communication and the grounding and the uh, the discharge of free radicals and other effects that uh, can occur, and recharging yourself. So. Uh, what is your sense of the energetics of walking barefoot on Earth, and why is it important? Yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, for one, energetically, all the, the Chinese medicine meridians and channels and yoga channels, you know, they, they sort of begin and end in the feet and hands. Oh, yes, right, um, right. So, you know, every step, not only are you you're stimulating all these points, um, right. So it's just activating the channels and just the natural motion of your arms swinging back and forth across your legs, just walking in general, but being barefoot is, is huge, not only just with that, that simple stimulation with your points, but yes, you're coming in contact with earth and that has a certain charge to it and you're becoming a little mini battery. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, so no, it's, it's, it's priceless. Not only that, but there's a lot of things that happens when you're barefoot, when you're barefoot, you are softer just the way you move through the earth and you can appreciate different places where you step, um, be it concrete, um, oh, yeah. you know, tile floor or moss, you know, earth, it's very soft. Then the way your feet can move over rocks and logs and stuff, they, like all those muscles get to move and it helps stimulate all the channels, which gets meridian flowing and the body is happier. Absolutely. And uh, some people claim that the Earth, the being that is the Earth, uh, can sense our every move, and that 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 uh, communication is more intense and personal when we're barefoot. Yep, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, not to, not to mention the the divas, elementals, fairies, and and so forth, the invisible realms uh, that we can communicate with as well. That I I do feel that we're those of us who are working in that direction towards raising our frequency are beginning to be able to perceive more directly into those worlds. Yep. Yeah, I agree completely. And it's just a matter of slowing down and, you know, practicing focus and and opening our minds and opening our sight and our, our vision. And yeah, it's amazing what we can hear. But first we have to First, we have to listen, uh, which doesn't really slow down enough. We have to want to listen, and we have to be empty enough to not project stuff and allow stuff to come to us. 
Right, right. And, you know, that brings up an interesting uh, point that we may be listening to the wrong sources of energy and information. So many people I see in the world are uh, addicted, basically, to television and radio and gadgets and, and computers and, you know, all of those things. But most importantly, uh, you know, sitting in front of television just uh, like uh, uh, zombies for hours at a time, soaking in all of those lower vibrations and the brainwashing and mind control that occurs. Um, you can't listen to yourself or to your higher self or to the inner guidance when there's so much uh, coming in at you and bombarding you and keeping you in a certain uh, uh, range of frequencies. Would, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I'm, I agree completely. You, you uh, read one of my chapters. Yeah, I read. What were my two steps toward enlightenment? Oh, gosh. Is this a, is this a test? <laughs> this is a test. Oh, my God. I'm not sure I can uh, come up with the answer. Um, I, I, can't, I can't think right in the moment. Will you share it, share it with us? So that we can... <laughs> the two were uh, get Turn rid off. of your TV. You're right. Get, right. Rid your, yeah, get rid of your TV and That's don't right. eat dinner. That's right. That's yes. I just yes, exactly. Now, um, and I love that. I thought that was great because it's it's rebellious, and it's it's something that everybody can do if they have the willpower. And the pro, the the painful truth is that most people don't have the willpower desire to do that. We you know we become complacent and we want to be hypnotized and we want to be taken care of and told what to do, and that leads to a victim mentality in which we're controlled and there are controllers. So um, I love that advice. Throw away your TV set. At, at the very least, unplug it and cut the cord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feel free to make there. it into an art project. You can hang it from the ceiling and throw darts at it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then I love the thing about eating one less meal a day because, you know, number one, um, I, I was just reading a book by um, – a uh, person, uh, Paul C. Bragg, uh, The Miracle of Fasting, as a matter of fact. And uh, there's a, a sufficient amount of evidence that we don't really even need to eat, that we benefit spiritually by fasting and clean, cleaning our inner body out, you know, the uh, physical body, our inner glands. And uh, that is also uh, a solution to world hunger, it's a solution to freeing up our time when we're so much time and energy spent getting money so that we can eat food. And then in the process of getting money, we don't have time to eat, so we have to go through drive throughs <laughs> and, and then to make it crazier, the drive throughs don't have any living food. There's nothing alive in any of those foods. In fact, everything is poisonous, cardboard and, uh, you know, I mean... Uh, uh, that pink fat substance that they put in foods. Most people, you know, go to the cheapest places because they don't have uh, five-star drive throughs yet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so then we're putting in dead food, and then we're hungry because the grease and fat that's in there is only a temporary solution. And then it, the body has to work overtime to digest it, and then we're stressed out because of the cell phone and conversations and our jobs and our laundry and kids and everything. So it's a wacky, crazy place. Uh, you know, it just seems like it's time for us all to consider our own lives and, you know, look at where we're leaking energy, where we're spending it, and what a, what a freeing up that is to, to learn how to cut back on a meal, especially at night. Now, you have insight into uh, the reason why that nighttime meal is so harming to the body, right? Uh, yeah, no, so the body... Um, rests, sleeps, as well as um, cleans itself most effectively, um, sort of in those early a.m. hours. And if we're if we have stuff in us, nah, not only are we never going to sleep quite as soundly, but the cleaning system of the kidneys and livers and the blood doesn't happen because the digestive process is going on. So, with if we go to sleep completely empty. Um, we're just going to be that much more rested. Our body's going to be cleaner. It's going to be lighter. It's sort of a mini fast, and it'll be just a more effective, happier day coming at you. Oh, absolutely. And uh, 
Uh, one of the things that I've implemented for myself, in addition to uh, completely changing my, my, my diet and uh, what I eat and how often I eat, uh, I'm looking at the possibility of using a combination of sun gazing and um, uh, that one of the, my guests uh, was on the show a while back, uh, a long time ago, Jazz Maheen the Breatharian, and yep. you you write about her in your book, and of course I started reading that. I thought, oh yeah, he knows Jasmine. Yeah, she's great. I love her. And uh, I, yeah, I, I met her. Uh, did you? I met her when she. I met her when. Uh, yep. Uh, we hung out for a bunch of days, but the day I met her was when she came out of being in the dark for a month. <laughs> wow. Well, t- tell us about that and what that is and how it works. I, they say that uh, when you go into the cave and you it gets so bright in there, people are saying, turn the light down. Yeah, uh, it does take. I've, I've been dying to try it, and I haven't caught. It hasn't worked out with my life schedule as of yet, but it's certainly on my list of things to do. Um, yeah, apparently the serotonin, melatonin they put up at levels change, and um, and your body just relaxes immensely because there's just no light. Your balance starts working back from the ear rather than the eye, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, a lot of people, there are examples of you start to begin to see the energy that's around objects and plants and people. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes it takes a bit of time. It's not an overnight thing. It takes uh, a couple of weeks, apparently, mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. to that point. Um, but no, it's everything that I've heard is it's very profound and life-altering in some way. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been waiting for, I don't know, there used to be one, apparently, in California, but it's closed down. I'm waiting for them to someone to fire up in the room. Mm, that would be interesting. Yeah, she's That'd a really cool person, isn't she? Yeah, she's a piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you to elaborate on that. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought she was great. Yeah, okay, good. They're good. In a yeah, good way, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. I think there's, uh, on the movie, she makes the final cut, but there is, I think in the, like the extras, beneath the sun on the DVD, I think there's, uh, a whole section with her. Um, we filmed her, uh, filmed a bunch of hours of her when we were in Thailand. Oh. I'll have to have her back on the show because uh, I was asking her recently about the practice of Shibambu, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, using uh, your own bodily fluids for healing and for food. And yeah. uh, many people are finding, and I have a guest, Andrew Weber, who had, does a lot of uh, research on this, and there's apparently there's a global... Urine conference. I didn't even know this. You know, these are big things. These are people that are doctors and, you know, uh, people who have done a lot of research on this subject. And it's an, another one of the ancient uh, practices that uh, we're just not familiar with over here that is not particularly popular because of the, the nature of it and, and the fact that it's unknown. And, and we only know what we get on the television set on uh, certain stations. So, um, yeah, not when. Um I was at Chinese medicine school. There were we had whole classes on that, uh-huh. and um, yeah, all the Chinese docs, the classic ones, classically trained ones, they spoke very highly of it and recommended it. And we had all sorts of paperwork. And since then, I've come across, across a couple of classical Eastern physicians um, mm-hmm. who who also they recommended to patients, you know, in Vermont even, which is <laughs> so I can't ever see it going over well, but. Um, no, he, I mean, one doc recommended it to my dad, and my dad did it. I was like, oh. <laughs> really? That, that is a good patient. Wow, how cool. Yeah. Did he now, the, I guess the research way back when with cancer and how the proteins work in the body and, and how the body and tries to fix them and regenerate them when you ingest it is, is pretty fascinating. Well, one of the things that I, uh, I was, I, I was going to mention, uh, I got sidetracked, is that I... In researching all of in the Shivambu and distilled water and the rest of it, uh, I discovered that there are about oh, 40 or 50 substances in tap water that are extremely harmful, and it's filled with fluoride and uh, you know chlorine. I mean, those are just the most obvious ones, and the fluoride accumulates in the pineal gland because it's like a magnet, and it pulls those uh, fluoride particles into the pineal and calcifies. So. Uh, I learned that the use of distilled water not only cleanses the body and the glands, but it also keeps 
those things that are attracted magnetically to our glands from attaching. It has to do with a positive-negative balance. So I only drink distilled water or reverse osmosis. I don't use anything You're that has fluoride in it. So I think a that's... wise man. <laughs> well, it's important. I mean, we're mostly water. And if water is as powerful and conscious and alive as we, uh, we think it is, according to Matsuru Emoto, then, uh, and, and people are working with programming water with consciousness and intent, then it makes sense that you would want the purest water that you could get. And distilled water uh, can even hold radiation because radiation is a heavier particle, and in the distillation process, only the pure water escapes as steam and is recollected, and that's what's the distilled part. So that's just another thing that I do personally. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big proponent of uh, healthy water ingestion. And well, I agree with you. I think I think that's uh, the general tap water ingestion is not helping. Right, right. Uh, you know, and, and we're <laughs> there's so many ways that we can be assaulted on the organic level. <clears throat> you know, just through the air and the chemtrails. And I mean, we could go on and on and on about the negative, but as you said, uh, it's probably best not to focus on things that are uh, illusory and passing, uh, because I do yeah. think that those things will pass. They they will not be uh, they will they they simply are not possible uh, in a world that is one that I'm going to live in. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem sustainable at all. No, and maybe bumpy bumpy for a little bit, but I also believe the other side is going to be the Adam and Eveish. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now, as you did the movie, <clears throat> I haven't seen the movie yet, so uh, I'll have to uh, I'll have to check that one out. But um, it looks like there are quite a few people who are hopping on the bandwagon of uh, sun gazing, which is, it just seems like a really wonderful experience for people to spend time together. You know, it's a, a great way to be with your kids, your spouse, your friends. You know. It's it's a sharing of light energy. I mean, what better way to to spend time than, than doing something that's really constructive? Um, did you find that there were uh, you know lots of people that were finding this to be yeah let's do this like you know as you went across the country, uh, it seems like there are hundreds and thousands of people who are now uh, practicing this. Do you get a lot of mail? Um, so yeah, a couple pieces of that when we were when I was starting. Um, for one, the internet hadn't quite gotten cranked up to speed. I don't even think, I'm not sure Google had started yet. Um, and I might go with, no, there were pretty much no sun gazers. Um, and I, a friend of mine, we tracked them down as best we could. I mean, we were desperate to speak to anybody else who had some experiences. Mm. And somehow, you know, the light kept shining toward us. And there, people were like, no, you guys are the most experienced. <laughs> we're like, You're it. We're, lo we're looking behind us, like, how could that be possible? <laughs> um, so that was that part. And it was great, uh, the, the three or four folks that we met and who were dabbling in it. It was wonderful to share experiences and be like, oh, God, I, we're not the only crazy people out there. <laughs> so it, it, it definitely lent support. Um, so now let's fast forward to now. Um, uh, a couple months ago, I was invited to Santa Barbara, and I was screening Eat the Sun and uh, just to answer questions after the movie. And it was unbelievable, the um, community up there of sun, sun gazers. Mm. Um, there were a whole bunch of them. And they had all sorts of their own experiences and thoughts and theories and techniques, and they were definitely a family. It was, it was pretty cool. I was like, oh, wow, that's just in one town. And then this past weekend at the Psychic Fair, they're seen this year in Reno, it's the sun. And some representatives of Tumilian University, Gene Boys School were there, um, as well as a bunch of their students. And there was the majority of the people who came to the conference, they had all had sun gazing experience. And that was, I was like, wow, we have come a long way. Um, just in that volume alone and, and what I hear now, people's experiences and yes, emails that I get from around the world. It's uh it's not only is it pretty global, but mm -hmm. um people are really pioneering their own 
not only techniques, but with their own experiences and with their own focus. And it's, it's pretty amazing. And just what started so sort of benignly and innocently, people are really sort of delving into themselves, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the idea that uh, I was? I, your book uh, caused me to reflect that uh, sun gazing reminded me of uh, Plato's allegory of the caves, where uh, you know the cave dwellers are so used to being in the dark that they the light is blinding and they they're afraid of it. And it occurred to me there's an interesting analogy that at, during sun gazing, uh, you become more and more accustomed to the the sun. As I understand it, you want to build up. Uh, the ability to do this for about 44 minutes a day over time, and the results are cumulative. And it uh, it reminded me that um, uh, with all the solar flares and the intense uh, bursts from the sun, maybe that's a, a practical way of uh, becoming accustomed to these frequency, uh, these bursts that are actually beneficial. Now, uh, what do you think about the idea that the sun, uh, the sun's uh, flares and all that are actually designed to benefit humanity, that they're not harmful? Um, yeah, I mean, that can go either way on that one. Um, okay. It's more how, how we take the information and how we react to it and how we respond to it. Mm. Um, I mean, that can be said for almost any example. Um, right. But there's you know there's a flip side to everything. Um, so no, and, and I, I I do agree, and I'm sort of not warn, but urge people to be very careful and go very slowly. And that you know the eyes are very very delicate, and there's no reason no reason to rush into this. Uh, life is not a race. Specifically, the practice right. of gazing is certainly not a race, and there's no you don't get a the big chocolate cake just because you're able to go a certain amount of minutes. So, and the, and the cones and rods and the physiology, physiological aspects of the eye, they take a little bit to, you know, to adapt and to change and to get used to such a different amount of light coming in. So it definitely goes slowly and it's sort of not too dissimilar from if you were to sit down and try to do 2,000 push-ups right now, it might hurt. <laughs> right, right. Um, I could do that. And, yeah, <laughs> so it's just to, to go slowly with it, and and to feel what you feel, and you know, listen attentively, and trust yourself, um, and be present. Well, of course, being present is a is a prescription for all of us in every moment uh, to uh, increase our uh, vibration and our consciousness. So yep. um, on page 91, you mentioned, you talk about the energy of life, <clears throat> and there's something that I didn't even think of before. It says, uh, cells are bipolar. A cell operates like a battery with the nucleus slightly acidic and the cytoplasm slightly alkali alkaline. A cell must maintain this bipolarity to function, and neutralization of these charges results in cellular, cellular death. And then you go on into the, the more... Uh, more of the logistics of how the cells work. Um, what are some of the uh, frequencies or the, some of the uh, uh, substances that the sun is uh, transmitting into the cells, and how does that allow the cells to function in a more balanced way? I've never heard about the cells being bipolar. That's really interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's, you know, how is sun gazing affecting us? Um, there are a lot of theories to that. Okay. Um, and, you know, I believe none of them and all of them, <laughs> um, which all is right. a little tricky. I mean, and then some, you know, some folks um, of the yoga tradition and some of the Western medical people who studied HRM, some of their theories involve how the light gets into the optic nerve and stimulates eventually the penile gland, and uh, that helps govern the hormones in our entire system. And it just helps bring balance um, in an energetic fashion. And then there's the theory that heme the, in the blood is the same functionality as chloroform. So essentially, 
the were the sunlight. The only time place sunlight can get directly to our blood is through our eyes. Um, and the theory is roughly it takes 45 minutes for uh, the body's blood to cycle all the way through. I don't know if that's applicable or not to the time frame uh, recommended by HRM. Um, but anyway, that we can become a plant, that there's oh. photosynthesis occurring in our blood. Oh. And our cells are going to react to it, and it's, you know, we're like mini little power plants oh. cranking away. Interesting. And, of course, the plants and the flowers all track the sun, and clearly they're, you know, this is a process that's happening on a much larger scale, and if we look to nature, uh, you know, we may benefit by following the examples that are around us. Um, one of the things I'm, I notice is that there are horses in the pasture near where I live, and they're constantly eating the grass down to the, to the base of the grass. And I thought to myself, now, isn't that strange that these huge animals that are so strong and beautifully built with all those muscles are vegetarians? They eat grass. And uh, one of my guests talked about how healing they are, that they're actually aware of, they can read our minds and our thoughts and our emotions, and they're used now in healing. Uh, there are some people who are using horses in healing processes. So I thought, this is interesting. And flowers follow the sun. So doesn't it make sense that we would, be, uh, would, would benefit somehow from at least spending some time tracking the sun uh, and allowing the sun to fall on our bodies, uh, preferably without clothes, I would think, uh, and barefoot? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, horses aren't, well, they do wear, they are, they do have clothes to, for when it's cold. They, they get things, you know, but uh, uh, I don't know too many animals that are born with, a, uh, you know, tuxedos, uh, unless it's yeah. penguins. But, uh, no, it's, uh, it's hard to find people who don't like just being in warm sunlight. Right, right. Um, so, uh as you got to 44 minutes, uh, what, what what did you do after you reached uh, after you wrote the book? How did that practice that you were doing continue? And what are some of the other spiritual uh, pursuits or spiritual practices that you found helpful? Um, yep. So the best part with <laughs> this is probably not going to sound appropriate, but. The most relieving and liberating aspect to making it to the 45 minutes was then the film crew was done following me around. Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) And that, I mean, Lance, I can't tell you, that was, it is so exhausting and trying constantly. (laughs) Having the cameras in your face, it's just, it's invasive and it's exhausting. Oh. So that was, I mean, that was that's so not exactly a spiritual. You don't think you're going to be a movie star when you grow up? <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, it was a lot. So oh. that was great, just to get a, get my life back, um, yeah. and and to have more peace just with my day to day stuff. Um, and then the the part that you know I can't reiterate enough to you know all the listeners and people out there and all the people that I've ever read about or met that have really found peace in themselves or you know found that special wall 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 internally uh-huh. the, the common denominator to every single one of them is you have to sit still uh-huh. like the act of meditating to be present to use as a tool to teach focus is paramount and and I know people want to change, and they're all psyched to change, but you actually have to change to change. You know, something's got to give. Yeah. And, and the only way that i found to be able to hear myself and what I feel and what's inside and what's going on is to sit still. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes a lot of work, and but despite whatever blood, sweat, and tears that go on when you're sitting on a cushion, it is well worth it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell a little story actually about I started getting deeper and deeper into meditation. You know, I had read all the Eastern philosophies of quiet the mind, quiet the mind. Mm. I'm like, yeah, knock it off. <laughs> um, so I'd been sitting, I was getting upwards to, uh, you know, six or seven hours a day. And, um, 
my mind started, there's a this series of a week, my mind just started speeding up and getting louder and louder and more and more. It was getting more and more difficult to sit still. And I was more and more agitated. I was like, holy smokes. And I just kept the willpower and following, you know, people in front of me and saying, just sit still. And the mind speeding up. And then suddenly, like, there's a separation where it, and it kind of moved over adjacent to me. Um, I was like, oh my God, that's what they're talking about, my mind. Like, our minds are not us. Um, mm-hmm. They may be our greatest asset and simultaneously our greatest liability, but it's they're not. It's some other thing. We are much more. And it wasn't until that moment where I fully realized that there was like an aha. Mm. And since that point, then it sort of quieted down, and it's never been, never been loud since, like to the point of driving me crazy. <laughs> um, which was which was refreshing. But the only way, like people could have told me that a hundred times, and I could have read it in three different languages, but until I actually experienced it, you know, it's hard to say. So, yeah, and all I can recommend is you gotta, if you want to get into it, man, you gotta sit still. Mm-hmm. Got to go inside, and and I'm I'm guessing that by sitting still you mean without noise. <laughs> it is easier that way. Yeah, you don't sit. I mean, you can you can put on people. Guns and Roses. If, yeah, you can put on Guns and Roses if you want, but it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna just it, there's a possibility it'll distract you. Right, right. What about the I mean, ideal, ideally we want to be you know in a meditative state always. Right. It's just it's just oh, a, yeah. It's just, it's a tool for learning how to be present. Exactly. It's mindfulness. It's uh, life is a walking meditation, and every step we take is a is a sacred step. So yep. I think once you get that, you know, once you that flip switch flips, then you understand that everything is known, and everything you do think, feel, and see, and so on and so forth, those are just the outer senses, the five senses that we have to navigate, but the other 360 or 355 or however many there are available, which is a lot more than the five, the subtle senses can begin to uh, activate once the, once the distractions from all of the other uh, input, sensory input that we consider us begins to diminish and we start picking up the subtle fields. And that's what I'm really curious about and I'm working on is tuning into the subtle realms and fine-tuning that uh, FM or uh, a station or dial to hear the higher tunes that are playing and not just the AM, FM radio. Yeah, no, that's that's by far the most important. Um, in a moment that you can feel how you engage, like how your choice is driven by you know, an emotion that is the beginning. Uh, as soon as we're aware of what drives our hungers, that's partly why I got into sun gazing because it was, it was disgusting hungers. It's too bad the media and pop culture got so wrapped into to eat or not to eat. Um, cause that was never the point in the beginning. The point was to understand our hungers, like understand what drives our choices. Mm. If we can get to the root, if we can get to the root of what drives our choices, then our choices are going to start coming from a place of more awareness. And inevitably, I I believe people are benevolent and yeah. will make healthier choices. And everything to me comes back down to the general health and well-being. And and until we take full self-responsibility for that, yeah, of course, our healthcare system is going to be entertaining. Right. <laughs> right, right. How do you see uh, the, what you're doing in relation to the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, it's sort of like comparing apples to tractors, really. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's <laughs> well, they're entirely different. different. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, have you had uh, Have you had to have any kind of? How is your health? That's uh, good. I mean, I'm okay. feeling a little tired right now, but um, no, I haven't. I haven't. I had a reckless youth um, with sports and life, so I definitely spent my fair share of time getting st- stitched back up when I was little. But uh, no, I haven't had health insurance in like 20 years. Wow, wow! Yeah. And uh, do you attribute uh, any of your health, be- your current health benefits, 
uh, to your spiritual practices and the the way that you're treating your uh, the bio the biology. Oh, 100 percent. Okay, yeah. good, good. No, no, I always, I've, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I, half of what I learned about general health and well-being was due to hearing physicians tell me when I was little, you know, this cannot be done or you will not be able to do this at some point. I was like, there's got to be another way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then getting into yoga, I mean, that really blew my mind of its possibilities Um, and Mm -hmm. just how quickly the body can respond if we just give it a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, if we learn to breathe, what can happen with just basic rhythm, breath, that's soft and effortless and if we understand the mechanics of how the diaphragm functions with the different aspects of the lung. And yeah, I know the body is capable of so much, um, mm-hmm. but we have to give it a chance, mm-hmm. right? We have to we have to create space in our lives for change to occur. It just doesn't, you can't cram it in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't put it in your calendar like, okay, we need <laughs> two o'clock on Tuesday, I need change. <laughs> no, it doesn't, the universe doesn't quite work like that. Right. Um, sometimes the, people compare the universe to a, an enormous uh, set of uh, feedback loops, and uh, you know that what we uh, what we put out there is uh, is is transmitted into our surroundings, and uh, it seems that if we're living a peaceful life, that our lives will be peaceful. Um, have you have you noticed the feedback being more uh, that is increasingly synchronous when you're in tune with yourself? Yeah, no, hundred percent. No, when you're aligned with yourself and um, and you're running your own system versus other people's wishes and dreams and uh, be it parents or coaches, or whatever, you're yeah, you'll always be healthier. Uh huh. Yep. And the universe will move for you um, when you're committed to a cause, regardless of it is. And any time you're out of sync with yourself and, you know, in some way you're being a jackass, if mm. you're paying attention, or even if you're not, the universe is going to spank you to <laughs> let you know. Right, you're right. Yes, that's that's been my experience in any case. Um, <laughs> it's very, it's relentless. Oh, yeah. In, yeah. in in like trying to speak to us, and it's been trying to speak to humanity for five thousand years. It's, it's just there's not many people listening. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you know we can ignore those uh, things that are just obvious to other people. Uh, usually, uh, our friends and relatives can see it before we do. But um, it's it's interesting that we can ignore those things. We can choose to ignore them, and the lessons keep getting more. Uh, more dramatic and more intense until we actually begin to be shocked out of our complacency and start taking responsibility for ourselves and what we're doing. It does seem to be a process like that. Um, did, are there any really profound moments of mystic, mystical uh, change that you had that stand out above the others? Um. Nothing. I mean, the biggest, the biggest pieces for me really were that any of this was possible. Uh-huh. That a human could go without food or water for a week, you know, without food for a long time. Um, you know, I grew up in a very conservative part of the world where you know there was tradition and there were guidelines, and that's it was life. Uh-huh. Um, and then to not only be in California, but be around everything that the Chinese medicine school is like being at Hogwarts and huh. it was mystical, and magical and wonderful uh, and mind blowing and mind altering, mind expanding daily. And then to actually experience stuff that, you know, I'd read in scientific books that wasn't possible. It just, it changed my perspective on our entire existence. Uh-huh. And that to me open the door to, okay, what else is inside and it, it, what's going on? And it turns out it's bottomless uh-huh. and wonderful. Um, but you, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta go get it. Right. Right. In a sense, you have to sit still in order to get that, which you have to go get. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. it's a paradox, but you know, it's that's how. I mean, it's a point. Yeah, to just point the camera not outside, right? But but inside, and that's the hard part because we're so used to, you know, I want to get a feeling of success by going and winning that race or by, you know, whatever, making a jillion dollars. But yeah. at the end of the day, that's a fleeting sensation. Yeah, yeah. Like the sustainable vibrations are a different, a different whole beast, and the feelings are exponentially wonderful. Yes. Well, um, what's next for you, Mason? Uh, we're almost at the end of the hour. Uh, what? Uh, what? Do you have any projects in the ca- in in the works, or uh, what? Uh, right not now? currently. i a um, couple folks talked about doing some more research, um, uh, specifically just physiological reactions to stuff with the sun. But as with these things, it takes a little bit of, a little bit of funding that hasn't been locked in yet. Um, so now I'm, there's. I'm still seeing patients and um, cheering along, considering writing another book, but I need some more experiences. Possibly spending a month in the dark will help inspire that. Yeah, good. But, um, yeah, no, just living every day is really, I mean, that's where the journey is. So right. I'll see where it all, where it all takes me. Well, wonderful. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed your book, and I recommend it, and... Um, uh, if you have any parting wisdom for the listeners, that would be great. And I'd like you to also be able to mention your website uh, again and where people can find you. Um, sungazing.com, and the book is The Earth is Flat. It's a page turner, people. You'll love it. <laughs> um, yeah, advice is to not take life too seriously, I uh. guess, really. I mean, you have to enjoy the process and find humor in it. It's, it's going to be challenging regardless of the trajectory you get set on. So if anything, if people can understand that there's a bigger game afoot with our existence, it hopefully will take pressure off the day-to-day mundane stuff that sometimes feels like we're getting weighed down. So literally you can be like you're reaching for a radio knob and just sort of turn down the serious and turn up the giggly and fun and creative. Um, you know, just makes life so much more fun. And the rest, the rest of the work will always be there, but got to enjoy it. I agree wholeheartedly. That's wonderful. Well, Mason, thanks a lot for being on tonight. And, uh, I, uh, just enjoyed your book and I'm talking to you tonight and, uh, and I appreciate your, what you're doing. Thanks a million. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.